Thomas. Hello, Thomas, and first of all, thank you very much for inviting me along to this. It's been a, it's a, it gives me great pleasure and it's a great honour to be uh, uh, to be invited. So I'm very pleased with that. Uh, I'll be sharing my uh, screen in a moment, and I will make sure that all the slides are available to people um, after the uh, after the presentation is finished. I'll also be uh, drawing on some of the slides as well as we go through and the annotations that I make so everything that I write onto the slides will also be saved and at the end this will be made available to everybody um, but there we go so first of all I'm going to share my screen and uh, here we go if I can find the the right screen that should be the right one so hopefully uh, you should see a screen. Can, if someone can just confirm, it says model based systems engineering part one complexity. Yes. Yes. It's, it's and, and, it, and it's the whole screen. Yep. 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 Perfect. That's absolutely perfect. So thank you very much for that. So um, thank you for the, uh, the lovely introduction. So as Thomas said, my name is John Holt. Uh, that's what I normally look like. At the moment, you've caught me at home in my home office. So I don't look quite like that. Um, I look a bit messier. I've normally got the hat on. You'll be pleased to know. Um, I'm also joined today. I've got my cat on my lap. So if you hear any strange noises, that might be the cat. That mm. might not be me. So I will just warn you about that now. Um, as Thomas said, I work for a company called Scarecrow Consultants. I'm also a professor of systems engineering at Cranfield University, and I'm the current technical director of Incosi UK. So to get to begin with, then when we when I was in, asked to do this, this is actually the first of three presentations that Thomas has asked me uh, to do. Uh, the problem that I have is whenever anybody asks me to do something, I immediately agree because it's months and months in the future. And then when the future arrives and the future becomes the present, I then think, oh, no, I've just promised to do three presentations. This is the first of three presentations and as such should be treated as almost like an introduction to what we're going to be doing in some of the others. So what I've been asked to talk about in the first one is the need for model-based systems engineering and, you know, to really sort of make the case for model-based systems engineering. So that's going to be the topic of today. There's not going to be much uh, MBSE technical content for today. We're going to be saving that for the other two presentations, but I am going to be going to be talking about why we need model-based systems engineering and why it is a real need. Now, a, a little bit about my background. Um, I've spent my whole career working in model-based systems engineering. And so for the last 30 years, um, that's pretty much everything that I've done has been model-based systems engineering. Although 30 years ago, it wasn't called model-based systems engineering. Uh, I was just applying modeling to, to different types of systems. And what I've seen is over those years is the, the questions that people would ask has changed significantly. So if I was to go back 20 or 25 years, I'd go to different conferences and different events. And some of you would have actually seen me at some of those. If some of the older members of the audience, like Andy, who's there, for example, would have seen me all these years ago. And I spent all of my life arguing with people about why modeling was a good idea and why we should model. And then about probably, um, let's say, 10 or 15 years ago, the question changed and people finally started to accept that modelling was a good idea and it was a good thing to do. But what people then wanted to know was actually, how do we model effectively and efficiently? So the question had changed. And one of the reasons why the question has changed, the main reason, is because uh, modelling became accepted. It became sort of popular wisdom rather than just a strange idea. And so that was very good, but the question changed. So the way that we deliver these presentations would change to reflect that. But what would what then happened, probably about five years ago, the question changed again. And the question then became, well, how do we deploy model-based systems engineering in our organizations? How do we implement this, this modeling, this MBSE in our organizations? So as the years have gone on, I've seen this change in attitudes and opinions towards MBSE and a far greater acceptance of MBSE. And, and you can see this, anybody that's been involved with Incosi for any number of years, just look at the papers that we have in the conferences. So, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, papers on MBSE 
would have a title, something like using MBSE to do this, applying MBSE to do this. They don't really do that anymore. They tend to just be titles like, um, you know, applying systems engineering to something. And men, most people now, I think it's fair to say, certainly in my experience, most people now are using to some level or another, some level of modeling and some level of MBSE. So I want to talk today about why that is and why we, we've seen this increasing need over the last few decades for model-based systems engineering. And I'm going to illustrate that with a few examples. And then I'm going to finish off by just talking about this evolution of MBSE as well and, and why, it's become, uh, why it's become so important. Now, I would say before we, uh, before we begin, people say, well, how is the need for model-based systems engineering different? from the need to systems engineering. And in my opinion, it isn't, because in my opinion, model-based systems engineering is systems engineering. There's nothing that we do in, in systems engineering that we can't do with model-based systems engineering. If we can pair MBST with a topic like requirements engineering, requirements engineering is a sub-discipline, it's a small part of systems engineering. MBSE isn't. MBSE is systems engineering. And if we're going to be arrogant about it, I would argue that uh, MBSE is doing systems engineering in a more rigorous, in a more repeatable, and in a more demonstrable way. And that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about over the course of these, of these three seminars. So let, let's move on and let's move on to the main subject of what we're going to talk about, which is this idea of the need for model-based systems engineering. And when we look at the need for model-based systems engineering, we can look at the need for systems engineering as our main influence for that. And if we talk about why we need systems engineering, um, to me, the answer is quite simple. There's lots of books on the subject, but basically um, we have system failures, we have system disasters, we have project failures, project overruns, and so on. It's very easy in the real world, and I think that's one of the big qualifiers for systems engineering, is in the real world, it's very easy for things to go wrong, okay? If things didn't go wrong, I wouldn't have a job, okay? Or I wouldn't have the job that I have now. Um, when we look at why things go wrong, if we start to do the literature work on system failures, system disasters, project overruns, we'll find that most literature agrees that there's three fundamental causes for things going wrong. And these are complexity in our system, more about that in a moment, communication problems, so we can't talk to different stakeholders in a way that they can understand, um, because different stakeholders speak different languages. So communication is key to everything that we do, but also this lack of understanding across the entire life cycle. And you have to remember that as systems engineers, we actually, we deal across the, the, the whole life cycle. At least we take into account the entire life cycle, even if we're not directly involved with each stage, we're aware of the bigger life cycle and we work bearing in mind that there are other stages in the life cycle. But what I want to focus on to begin with is this idea of complexity. And that's going to be the, the, the main focus of discussion for today, because we'll see that this is one of the big drivers for MBSE. So when we talk about complexity in our system, first of all, you know, what do we mean by complexity? And, you, you know, where does it occur? So there's two broad categories of complexity. There's what we refer to as essential complexity and what we refer to as accidental complexity. Now, essential complexity is called essential because it lies in the essence of the system, okay? It's naturally how complex something is. And we can't really reduce that, we can't, we can't lower that level of complexity. However, just because we, we can't reduce that, it doesn't mean we can't manage it in some way. So we can actually manage the essential complexity even if we can't reduce it. So for example, if we can identify this where this complexity lives, we can maybe minimize the way that we interact with that part of the system. So if we find that one part of the system exhibits a lot of complexity, then maybe we can limit the way that we interface with that part of the system or the behaviors associated with that part of the system. So although we can't lower or reduce 
the, uh, the essential complexity because it's naturally how complex something is, we can certainly try to manage it and cope with that complexity. The other type of complexity that we need to be aware of is what we refer to as accidental complexity. And accidental complexity is our fault. Accidental complexity is introduced by our people, our processes, and our tools. So that we certainly can reduce. We can lower accidental complexity. But again, a, a crucial part of that, an important part of that, is being, being able to identify the complexity in the first place. So with essential complexity, we can't lower it, but we can manage it, but we need to identify it. With accidental complexity, we can lower it, but again, we need to be able to identify where this complexity lives. So it would be good if we could spot or we could see or identify this complexity. And so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to attempt to draw on my screen for the first time. And I'm going to draw three boxes. And I'm going to label them A, B, and C. OK. And there's a couple of things I need to uh, point out at this, uh, at this juncture in the presentation. So some of you may have uh, spotted I'm wearing dark glasses. Now, the reason I'm wearing dark glasses is because I'm quite badly dyslexic, okay? And these help me not be quite so badly dyslexic. I'm very confident that I can spell the words uh, A, B, and C that we can see on here, but beyond that, there's no promises. So when I write words on the screen, if they're not in the traditional um, order that you're used to seeing them, so maybe the letters are in the wrong order, or there's more syllables than is traditional, then you don't need to point it out to me. I know that I'm doing it. Okay, so that's the first thing. If there's any peculiar spellings, that's my dyslexia. It's it's kind of it is me, but it isn't me. If that makes sense. So what I've got here then are three things that are going to form part of our overall system, and I'm just going to label these. A, B, and C. Now, these could be anything. These could be systems or subsystems or processes or organizations, people. It doesn't really matter. So for the sake of the example, let's imagine that A, B, and C, each one of those is a statement of need. It's a requirement. OK, and let's imagine that each requirement is uh, has been very well written. It's got some lovely text associated with it, and it's got a unique identifier and so on. And let's imagine that I read A and I understand A and I read B and I understand B and I read C and I understand C. Now, the assumption that is often made at this point is that because I understand A, B and C, that as I understand the system as a whole, I understand the requirement set as a whole because I understand each of the constituent parts. However, that's not actually the case, OK, because what we've got here is an oversimplified representation of the true situation. So what I can do, I can actually start to introduce some complexity into this by just drawing some lines between these. Because each time I draw a line between them, what I'm actually doing is identifying relationships. And every time I have a relationship between these three, in this case, these three requirements, I've identified potential interactions between these elements. And this is one of the main ways that complexity manifests itself in the real world is on the interactions between things. So I need to make sure that I can identify these, otherwise the complexity is hidden from me. If I draw some more lines again, this is becoming more complex. And if I take my red pen and draw on lots more lines, this is absolutely horrible, okay? But what people will say at this point very often is, well, hang on, you've just made this more complex. You've introduced all this complexity. You've made it more complex. I used to understand it. I understood A, B, and C, and now I've drawn all these lines on. I've made it more complex. I haven't made it more complex. What I've done, I'm a systems engineer. And one of the things that we apply in systems engineering is systems thinking. And one of the key tenets of systems thinking is we don't think about things in isolation. We think about them and the relationships between them. And that's key to our understanding of things. So what I've done, I haven't made this more complex. 
what I have done, I have highlighted the complexity that was previously hidden in my system. I've highlighted these relationships on here and therefore these potential interactions, therefore this complexity, but I haven't introduced that complexity myself. It was always there that previously it has been hidden from me. So this is one of the ways and a very good way that we can identify that we can see complexity in our system. And a very good way to do this is by applying modeling, because when we model, we think about things, and very importantly, we think about relationships between them, and we visualize them. And that's one of the key parts of modeling is visualization. And by visualizing these lines, it allows me to visualize the complexity that's actually in my system, whether I realize it's there or not. So we need to identify complexity in order to cope with essential complexity and in order to lower accidental complexity. And this is one of the ways that we can use, for example, modeling to do that. But what we now need to consider is the nature of this complexity and very importantly, how this complexity has changed or how it's evolved over the last few decades. So we're going to consider um, a simple example. So this is a, an old car. OK, uh, so the system we're going to consider is that of a car or an automobile. This is one of the first cars that I ever owned. OK, this is a 1969 Triumph Herald. Technically, it's a Vitesse, but it's a Herald. OK, um, and Triumph many, many years ago in the UK, we used to have a car industry. We don't really anymore. But Triumph was one of our uh, one of our big companies. I didn't own this car from new, but it was a fabulous car. It was very, very beautiful. And I loved this car before it died on me. If we treat this car as a system, we can ask ourselves a few important questions. So as we would for any sort of system, we can ask ourselves, what's the high level need for that system? What's the high level needs? And the high level need for this system is to take me from A to B. Now, anybody that ever owned a car of this age, or maybe your parents owned a car of this age, will realize that this system very rarely satisfied both of those requirements in any single journey, okay? Um, if we then ask ourselves, what, what are the, how do I interact with this car? What's the human machine interface? We'll say, well, for the car, it's the steering wheel. It's the gear control and it's some pedals that I press with my feet. So very high level, very simplistic view of my system now. What's the need is to get me from A to B. What's the human machine interface? It's the, it's the uh, steering wheel, the gear control, and the pedals. If I compare this system with its modern day counterpart, okay, it might look something like this. Now, it doesn't matter what uh, what make this car is, you know, who the manufacturer is or, or anything like that. Uh, all we need to know is that this is a, representing a modern connected vehicle that might be autonomous or semi-autonomous, and it's an electric vehicle, for example. Okay. And if I ask myself the same questions concerning the modern vehicle, what's the basic need? It's to get me from A to B. And if I ask myself, what's the human machine interface? Well, it's a steering wheel. It's a gear control and it's pedals, okay? Um, if we had no domain knowledge regarding cars, regarding automobiles, if we just considered these as systems and we had no domain knowledge and we looked at the overall need and the HMI for each of them, we might be fooled into thinking that we would realize them in the same way. OK, because the basic needs the same and the HMI is the same. Uh, what we need to appreciate is that is, is simply not the case that we're seeing here. And because if I were to say to you which is more complex, the modern vehicle that we can see on the right hand side or the old vehicle from 50 years ago on the left hand side, almost everybody would say the modern vehicle. But it's not good enough just to say which is more complex. We have to consider the complexity and the way that that's changed or the way that that's evolved over the last few decades. And we're gonna consider four ways that that's changed. And the first way is to consider the system elements and therefore the interfaces between them. 
if we consider the system elements for this car on the left hand side 95 percent of them are mechanical okay there's a few electrical elements there are headlights there are windscreen wipers there's a horn that goes beep beep and there's a the starter motor that's it the wiring diagram, the electrical wiring diagram for this vehicle fits on one side of a single sheet of paper and there's still enough room around the edge to make notes. OK, it's incredibly simple, the electrical system. Therefore, if we consider the interfaces on this system, the vast majority of interfaces are mechanical. There's a few electrical and there's a very few electromechanical interfaces. So you can imagine the system elements has been like A, B and C on the previous side and the interfaces being like the lines between A, B and C. OK, if we move. So and that was what a car would be typically like in the 1970s. If we move into the 1980s, what we'll see is there's a brand new type of element starts to arise and that's electronics. OK, so we've now got more letters, A, B and C, D, E, F and so on. But very importantly, because it's a new type of system element, it brings with it new interfaces. So now we've got electronic interfaces. We've got electronic to electrical interfaces. We've got electronic to mechanical interfaces. So the number of letters, A, B and C is increasing. The number of lines is increasing. Therefore, the complexity is increasing. If we move into the 1990s, we start to see software being deployed around the car, individual pockets of software. Again, a new type of system element, therefore new types of interfaces. If we go into the 19, uh, uh, into the 2000s, we start to see networks. So controller area networks and things like that, buses around the, the, the car system. So again, more elements, more interfaces, protocols, all these extra levels of complexity coming in. And if we look at a, a, a car, a modern day car, it's also connected. It's connected to the outside world. It's connected to GPS and all sorts of other things. So what we now start to see is this whole other level of interfaces. So what's happened is as time has gone on over the last few decades, the system elements, it's not just the number of them has increased, the nature of them has increased because of things like technology, and therefore the number of interfaces has increased. So overall, the complexity of this system compared to this one is incredibly high. Okay. The second way that I want to look at is by considering the constraints that we have on this system. And by constraints here, I mean anything that's going to limit the way that I can realize my system in some way. So things like safety, reliability, maintainability, and so on. Let's consider safety to begin with. Well, this car, um, it had seat belts in it, in the front, but not in the back. The seat belts that it had in the front were like you get on an aeroplane. They were the ones you put over your lap. They, you, they were static. You had to adjust them manually each time you got into the car. They didn't go over the shoulder. And here's the, here's, here's the kicker here. Here's the big thing. Up until 1983 in the UK, it wasn't, it wasn't the law. It wasn't mandatory to wear seat belts in a car. Okay. It wasn't until 1991 that it became law in the UK to wear seatbelts in the back of a car. Now, if you compare that to today, if you got into a car today and there were no seatbelts, you'd get straight back out again. And what's changed here is our attitude towards safety, but also the constraints that we have. So things like the standards, the legislation. OK, this system on the right hand side here, not only does it have seatbelts, it's got airbags, it's got crumple zones, it's got side impact protect, uh, protection. It will stop you veering into the, the next lane on the motorway. Uh, it will stop you crashing into the car in front. And what's changed here is the constraints that we have there. And these constraints are driven by things like the different stakeholders' attitudes towards things. Think about the environmental aspects of this. It won't take you long because there aren't any environmental aspects of this. It's got an internal combustion engine. It's got leaded fuel. There's no concept of either using recycled parts or recycling the parts afterwards. All these are now enshrined in standards and legislation that we can now see. 
Look at the stakeholder expectations of these cards as well, introducing more constraints, maybe not legal constraints, but customer constraints. Up until, let's say, five years ago, many cars, when you saw an advertisement on television, were sold on the basis that they went very fast and they went very fast very quickly, not to 60 in five seconds and so on. We don't sell cars like that anymore. We sell cars based on the user experienced, based on the driver experience. So the whole attitude towards these constraints has changed enormously over the last few decades. And because of these, uh, you know, far more constraints, it's increased the complexity of our systems. The third way that the complexity has increased is because the system that we see on the right hand side is truly a system, part of a, a wider system of systems. We live in a connected world. Our entire world is connected. Everything we buy is connected to the internet of things, to the internet, to the cloud, and, and so on and so forth. And cars are no different. What we're starting to see is now, so when I talk about a system of systems, um, it's not just a number of systems interacting with one another. It's a number of systems interacting with one another to deliver some sort of high level behavior or capability that none of the constituent systems, what we refer to as constituent systems, can do by themselves. And so, for example, now um, in the UK, the wider system of systems for the car is the UK road network. Now, if you've ever driven in the UK, it may be difficult to believe that there's any sort of higher level intelligence that's uh, monitoring and controlling the way that we drive our cars, but there is. Um, so the, the, the traffic flow is monitored on motorways, the speeds will change, traffic lights will change and so on. We've got this higher level system of systems that's using information that's shared by our vehicles to give us a more seamless journey. I can take this up to the next level and say, well, what about the transport network in the UK? What we're able to do now, I can leave where I live and say, I live in Wales on the, on the left of England. If I want to travel to London, I can get an app and say, take me to London and do it in as green a way as possible. And what will happen, the app will say, leave my flat where I live, get on a, a bicycle, cycle to the train station, get on this train. When I get to London, there'll be an electric taxi waiting for me and that will take me to my destination. I'm now dealing with end-to-end -end capability here rather than making these individual um, uh, plans myself. So the, the car is truly part of a wider system of systems. And this leads us on to the, the fourth point I want to make. Oops, spoiler alert. The fourth point I want to make which is this of a complexity shift. If we look at the elements that uh, comprise our systems now, let's look at the motor in both of these. The motor in my old Triumph Herald is an internal combustion engine. It's entirely mechanical. If I look at the complexity of that motor, it's mechanical complexity, okay? If I look at the modern day counterpart, if I look at an electric motor, the mechanical complexity is, is almost trivial. There's basically this one moving part in an electric motor, and that's the rotor that whizzes around in the middle. The complexity comes in because of the software that's controlling it. So it's not fair to say this is more complex than this. This is it's different types of complexity. We've seen a shift away from mechanical to electrical when it comes to engines, for example. But we're also seeing this shift not just in the technology that we're using, but also relating back to system of systems, the responsibilities that I had as the driver in this old car, in the old Triumph, are now largely being taken up by the car, by the actual, the system part of it. This system is now interacting with the outside world. Whereas I used to have to use my eyes and ears, I don't have to quite as much anymore because we've seen this shift away from what we've got here into this, these automated systems, these cleaner systems that we're starting to see on the right-hand side. And just to really compound things, all of these things work together. I've got an electric vehicle. I would love to say it's a Tesla, but it isn't. I've got an electric, um, what we call in the UK, a moped. So if you know like, like a Vespa or a Lambretta or something like that, I've got an electric one of those and it's fabulous. And it exhibits all of these things. There's a complexity shift. It's got a, a, a twisty grip that makes it go forwards. It's got a battery under the seat. It's got a Bosch washing machine motor on the back wheel, and it's got software. 
okay we've seen this complete shift in complexity it's truly part of a wider system of systems i've got an app so if i have a fleet of these i can control the fleet of them it connects to gps and 4g okay it tells you where it is at any point in time it runs diagnostics it will tell me if it's moved if it's fallen over uh, it'll plot every route that i take and tell me the average speed and so on the system elements and interfaces that we got on there now are, are completely different from what we used to have. The constraints, safety, it limits the speed. It won't let me go over a certain speed. It won't let me decelerate more than a particular rate of change. Okay, It reclaims energy from when I put the brakes on and uses it to charge a battery. It's got cruise control on it. This, this, this thing is crazy, but it's what we're seeing here is the manifestation of all these different types of complexity that have evolved over the last few decades. So it's not good enough just to say the complexity is higher. We have to think about why it's higher and how this complexity has evolved over time. And complexity has a shape. And the shape that complexity has is the shape of a brontosaurus. And this is what we refer to as the brontosaurus of complexity. And the idea is that the magnitude of the complexity is analogous to the thickness of the brontosaurus. So there's a thing called the brontosaurus theory that was first coined in 1972. And the brontosaurus theory states that a brontosaurus is very thin at one end, it's much, much thicker in the middle, and it's very thin at the other end. And the idea behind this is that whenever we start a project, this is a human eye, we look into the face of the brontosaurus. And when we look into the face of the brontosaurus, what we see is the, we wanna go from A to B. We, we see, this is the human machine interface. We see the very simple high level representation of what our system is. And the complexity as a consequence of that is very low. And we look into the smiley face of the brontosaurus and the brontosaurus smiles at us and we smile back. And the brontosaurus winks at us and we wink back. And the world is a very happy place and we do all of our cost and time resource estimates based on the smiley face of the brontosaurus. But then we start to deploy our systems techniques. We start to model things. We start to do stakeholder analysis and the, the complexity starts to increase. We start to do contextual modeling. The complexity starts to increase. We start to do scenario modeling. The complexity increases. We look at different candidate solutions. We end up here in the belly of the brontosaurus where the complexity has got out of hand. There's different people using different software to do the same thing, or even worse, different people using slightly different versions of the same software that are in no means, by no means compatible. You go into a room, someone's drawn a diagram, this is big as a wall, and they say, look at my diagram, it's as big as a wall, aren't I clever? And the answer is, you're very clever, but nobody can understand your diagram because it's as big as a wall. What we have here, when we're in the belly of the brontosaurus is a solution to the problem that we got here, but it's overly verbose, it's overly complex, it's difficult to understand, and we can't communicate it very effectively to the different stakeholders in a way that they can understand. And you say, well, hang on, what, what's wrong here? I've done everything right. I've done all the right things, but the complexity is now, it's gone out of hand. But then something interesting happens, because if we continue with our modeling, if we continue with our MBSE, the complexity starts to go down and it goes down and down until we get to the tail, until we get to that point. And what we have at this point is a concise, elegant solution to the problem that we had up here. It's as simple as necessary, not as simple as possible, as simple as necessary and no more so. We can understand it and very importantly, we can communicate it to the different stakeholders in a way that's meaningful to them. In order to go from the smiley face to the tail, we always have to go through the belly beforehand. It's impossible to make the transition from smiley face to tail without going through the belly. I've been doing MBSE for 30 years. I can't go from here to here without going through the belly. However, if we employ MBSE successfully, what MBSE will do it will make the transition as short as possible. And crucially, it will make the belly as slim as possible as we're making this transition from smiley face to tail. So the complexity will always go up, but using MBSE will allow me to control and to manage that complexity and to make the whole transition as painless as possible. When it comes to deploying MBSE, the things, various things we need to consider 
we mentioned accidental complexity and we mentioned this is because of it's our fault because of our people our processes and our tools this is what we can see here by people we mean competent people with the appropriate skills to do their job by process we mean approach do we have a good approach in place and by tools we mean anything that's going to enable us or make our lives easier but these lines are important. We mentioned how important the lines were. There's just two lines on here at the moment, and these are crucial. We need to make sure that the competencies of our people, the skills, the knowledge, the attitude of our people enables our approach, okay? They've got to be very closely coupled. We also need to make sure that our approach drives the tools and not the other way around. As soon as we use any tool, it's going to constrain us in some way. OK, um, we need to make sure that our approach drives it. We can control the way that the tool is being used. We shouldn't be changing the way that we work because that's what the tool wants us to do. That way lies madness. OK. And this brings us on to the whole idea of the evolution of MBSE. As the complexity of our systems evolve over time, as the complexity evolves over the time, so must our approach to systems engineering. And the main point that I want to make today is MBSE, we should consider as being a natural evolution of systems engineering. If we look at how, how MBSE evolves, if we're trying to deploy it in an organization, we've identified five stages here document-based systems engineering, document-centric systems engineering, model-enhanced, model-centric, and model-based systems engineering, okay? A document-based approach, obviously the graphics representing the pile of documents, but crucially, it's representing where the information and the knowledge that we need to develop our system lives. What owns it and where does it live? It's owned by the documents and it's split across this disparate set of documents across the whole organization. Usually hundreds, if not thousands of different documents across the whole organization, okay? And this is what we mean by a document-based approach to systems engineering. All of the knowledge, all of the information lives in and is owned by the documents. And I would say at this point, and I'm being very serious about that, there's nothing wrong with this because what people will often say to me is, we've been using the same approach, the document-based approach for the last 20 or 30 years. Why should I change to a model-based approach? There's nothing wrong whatsoever with a document-based approach. If you want to build Triumph Heralds, if you want to build a, a system of the level of complexity of a Triumph Herald, then this is perfectly acceptable. If you want to build a modern connected system where we see in those four different types of complexity, the system elements and interfaces, the constraints, the connectedness, the system of systems, and the complexity shift, then the techniques that you use to realize that system are going to have to evolve as well. Model-based systems engineering, I would argue, is a natural evolution of document-based systems engineering. We go to document-centric, where we see diagrams and pictures being used to enhance what's already there. That's why the pile of documents has got bigger. We start to see at stage three, the model emerge from our documents, okay? It's incomplete, it's very incomplete, but it's emerging from our documents. Stage four, model centric, we see the, the model is almost complete and stage five is complete. But people will say, what? So we, we're never gonna have documents again. No, of course we're gonna have documents, but the point here is our documents at this point are just different visualizations of my views. They're different manifestations of my model views. They're not entities in their own right. They don't own the information. They don't own the knowledge. It's just a way to visualize that information and knowledge using text, using graphics, using whatever. When we have a model-based approach to systems engineering, all of the information, all of that knowledge is brought together into a single conceptual place that we refer to as the model. And crucially, all of that information is consistent. Otherwise, it's not a model. When we talk about model-based, it doesn't mean we're getting rid of documents. It doesn't mean we're getting rid of text. It doesn't mean we're doing everything in SysML. We can use whatever notation, whether it's SysML, whether it's simulation, whether it's mathematical languages, whether it's text, whether it's tables. What MBSE is concerned about is all of that information is consistent with each other and we're presenting this single source of truth. 
that's what we're talking about with model-based systems engineering. So I introduced this, but I spoke about there is a, there's a very real need for MBSE. And this is the point that I want to make now. MBSE, we're not just doing it because it sounds like a good idea or it's the latest technique or whatever. There's a need for that because the complexity of our system has evolved enormously over the last few decades. And as the complexity of our systems has evolved, so must our approach to systems engineering evolve to match that. And that's where I see model-based systems engineering. Okay. In the next presentations, I'll be talking about more specific technical aspects of MBSE and how we can, uh, how we can use MBSE to realize everything that I've spoken about today. Before we go, Christmas is just around the corner. Everybody loves Christmas presents. Buy your whole family some books. Buy all 17 of my books and get a free shrine. Um, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to come in. Thanks to Thomas. Thanks to Amir. Thanks to Incozy. Thanks to Incozy German chapter and all the sponsors. Uh, please follow us on, uh, on LinkedIn. Join us for our silly puzzles that we do every Friday morning. And thank you very much. So many people for turning up and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, John, for the great presentation. Um, I will look now over the questions that have been posed and from the audience. And the first one is from Mr. Coleman. So isn't MBSE just a tool approach to system engineering? No, I, I would argue it's not just a tool approach. And that's very important because what I, I'm, and I'm going to, this is going to be the main focus of the next presentation. MBSE is a lot more than the tool. Okay. The tool allows me to implement things. It will allow me to implement, for example, notations. Notation are very important. Things like SysML are important, but they're a small part of it. We've also got to have an approach in place. We need processes in place. We need frameworks in place that allow us to control the model. The model itself is our abstract representation of the system. The goal of MBSE is not to produce a model. The goal of MBSE is to realize the system successfully. We just happen to be doing that by using a model. The tool itself is crucial, but it's one small part of the big picture that's MBSE. And so I would argue, no, it's not just a tool-based approach to doing it. Being tool-based is important, but that's a small part of the big picture that's MBSE. Okay. And as, as I said, okay. that will be the main discussion for the next uh, for the, for the, for the next presentation. Ah, we will look forward for it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the next one, uh, surely if the need for MBSE is no different from SE, um, there would be no motivation for the organization using document-based system engineering to model-based system engineering. Well, I, I think that's that's the point I was making, is the reason is if the complexity hadn't evolved so much over the last few decades, you'd be absolutely right. And there's still a lot of value in a document-based approach to systems engineering. But when you see just how complex our modern day systems are, the approach that we take needs to evolve to match that because using a mod, using a document-based approach when we've got literally tens of thousands of different elements, interacting elements in our systems is, is no longer good enough. And so I would argue that if, if the complexity hadn't evolved, I would agree with you 100%. And for some people, to be perfectly fair, you don't need to go to model base if you're dealing with systems that you understand that are relatively straightforward. But as the complexity evolves, so the there's, there is this need to evolve into a model based approach. Okay. Okay. Next question: Could you please elaborate on your statement about MBSE uh, is like SE because models are a part of SE exactly like how you said requirement engineering is. I would like to understand more about your statement. Right, so um, if we look at requirements engineering, yes, models are part of that, okay? But requirements engineering, like design, like implementation, like test, they're, they're a part of the big picture that systems engineering. Model-based 
systems engineering is not just a small part of the big picture of systems engineering. It allows us to realize the big picture of systems engineering. So yes, we can use MBSE to do our requirements, to do our analysis, to do our design, to do our implementation and our test and our support and our operations and retirement and so on. So that's what I mean by that is MBSE, we can apply across the entire life cycle to all these different sub-disciplines of systems engineering that we would traditionally see. Okay. Do you have a concise, adequate definition of complexity as used in this presentation? And how does it relate to complexity, complexity theory? Um, the, yeah, so I mean, that, that's the point that we've, you know, I've been trying to make in this. I've deliberately avoided the whole issue of complexity theory. When it comes to things like measuring complexity and the way that we analyze things like nodes and interactions between them, that's a whole other area. Again, that's a whole other uh, you know, presentation. I deliberately wanted to keep it very high, of, uh, and, you know, high level to what we've got here. So that's why there wasn't any, you know, uh, you could argue there wasn't much rigor to the definitions that I was using for complexity, but I was trying to aim it at a very pragmatic reason and to make the point of why we need model-based systems engineering. Um, all of the, um, if we look at complexity theory, all of the techniques, um, all of the sort of measurements, the metrics and so on that we can apply to there and the, the theories that are associated with it equally apply to what I've done. I was just deliberately trying to keep it at a very high level rather than to get bogged down in a big debate about exactly what uh, do we mean by complexity. So that's why I was trying to uh, explain it through examples rather than through, for example, mathematical formula. So. Okay. Yeah, we have quite a few questions. Yeah, we, we, we've only got on 60 more and... comments and 30 more questions, so that's fine. <laughs> so. Better than otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Is modeling a system using MBSE tools and methodology, but not including executable models and simulations still accounted as a MBSE application, or is it just called drawing? No, I, I would say MBSE encompasses the simulations and the mathematical side of the modeling. Absolutely, definitely. When we talk about frameworks, so I'll, I'll talk about this in the next presentation, it's important to realize there's more to MBSE than there, than there is just doing the SysML diagrams, for example. We need to look at what I would call the model-based engineering. So things like electrical modeling, uh, uh, heat transfer modeling, simulations, physical modeling, all these uh, need to be represented within MBSE because what we're concerned about with the model is the consistency of all this information, regardless of whether it's visualized in SysML, in the SysML modeling tool, or whether it's done in MATLAB or, or Simulink or DAWs or, or an electrical wiring diagram, all of those things need to be consistent and therefore uh, in my opinion, that's all under the umbrella of model-based systems engineering. Okay, next question. Given that the reason for a car has no, not changed, aren't the majority of your described current complexity based on the implementation choices rather than complexity introduced by the problem domain? Hence, are actually implementation complications introduced complexity rather than actually complexity. Well, and I think that's a very good point. And I would argue there that in some cases, yes, we're introducing complexity for the sake of it, particularly with some technologies. We're introducing it for convenience rather than that there's any you know, dying need for it. But many of the aspects of complexity, particularly where the constraints come in, no, they're necessity. Okay, and that's because things like people's attitudes have changed over the years. And because people's attitudes have changed, things like standards and legislation have also changed over the years. Okay, you could argue that the function of a car isn't different because we've got seatbelts. That's true, but actually it's made it a lot safer and safety is a big concern. And it's a paramount concern now when it comes to the different stakeholders looking at it. So I would agree that in some instances, and particularly with some aspects of technology, they're a convenience for us to make our lives more comfortable. But I would also argue that many of them, particularly things like constraints and the system of systems aspects, are there for very real and very pragmatic reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay. All of the aspects related to increase the 
complexity of today's vehicles seems to be to be related to the abilities, not to the functional aspects. Wouldn't you agree? I believe, at least in automotive, incidentally, complexity is strongly coupled with our professional discipline. So shouldn't we blame ourselves for the increase of complexity? Could you please spare a few words for that on that? Yeah, and I think this relates to the previous point. So, you know, the, the safety, the security, all the illities and so on. Yes, the need for those, or sorry, not the need for them, but the driving forces behind them have increased. And I think you can argue that we, you know, we've introduced those, but we've introduced it for very practical reasons. We want our systems to be safer. We want them to be more secure. We want them to be greener. And you could argue, well, functionally, that doesn't make any difference. Yeah, but anybody that designs a system purely on function is not designing a real system. We need to take in, into account the constraints. And I would accept that, particularly in, in things like automotive, the non-functional aspects of our, of our system have overtaken the functional aspects of our system. And if you look at autonomous vehicles, the actual technology to do the functional Uh, you know, self-driving vehicles, for example, is there. And it's the non-functional things that are holding that up. It's the safety, it's the security, uh, and so on. So I would argue it is, but I would also argue that as systems go on, we're listing more to stakeholders. Automotive is a good example. You could design a perfectly functional car, but nobody would buy it if it wasn't safe. Nobody would buy it if it wasn't green, for example. These are the things that are giving people a competitive edge, and this is how we're selling these systems now. So I would agree that, yes, you know, functionally, maybe not a lot of change, similar to the last question, but because of things like these constraints and the stakeholder attitudes, things have changed beyond all recognition. And I think if anybody thinks that we're just delivering systems on function now, that they're misguided. You know, it's not. It's all to do with the, the non-functions, the constraints, and so on. And this is what's driving a lot of, a lot of what we're doing now as systems engineers. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we have two questions. It seems uh, uh, quite similar. I take the last one. How would you sell it to general uh, management? <laughs> well, the way, the way that you sell MBSE is different depending on who you're talking to. Now, one of the points about modeling is all modeling is context-based. It depends on your point of view. The arguments you make for selling MBSE to engineers are not the arguments you make for selling MBSE to the investors. Okay, so again, this is the subject of another presentation, but I'll try and kind of summarize now. Um, things like improve consistency, reuse, you know, automatic document generation. These are things that tool vendors use, and I think quite rightly, to sell tools to engineers. That's not how we're going to sell them to managers. The way that we sell these to managers and going up to board level is we need to say things, no, it's going to increase our return on investment. How is it going to return or increase on investment? Well, it's going to in increase our market share because we're listening to things like the constraints. It's safer, it's more efficient, and so on and so on. When we sell to managers, again, there's no point talking about the technical aspects. To sell to a manager, you need to talk about how cost, time, and resource can be lowered by applying model-based systems engineering. So there isn't a single argument for why you should, uh, how you should sell model-based systems engineering. You need to look at the stakeholder you're talking to, whether that's an engineer, a manager, somebody at board level, or anything like that. And you need to say, from their point of view, What are they looking for? What's going to excite them? And what's going to, you know, what's going to make them take notice? That's what we need to capture. And that's what we need to articulate using MBSE. And I think this is one of the big problems that we have is the selling of MBSE. So I think for too long, we've sold it on the technical aspects and we haven't moved up the chain up to the board level to say, no, this is going to in in improve our return on investment. This might stop a recall of a car, for example. This might improve the way that we meet the standards. This is going to allow us to meet the new government environmental standards that are coming in in five years' time. All these sorts of issues, these are the things that are going to excite the, uh, the board level people, certainly not telling them things like we, we can automatically generate documents or, you know, we can reuse some of these model things. They're very good and they're very powerful, but we need to pitch the arguments at the right level in the right context to the stakeholders that we're dealing with. And I think this is one of the big problems that we have with MBSE at the moment is the way that we, the way that we sell it. So I think that's a really good question.
So the answer is it's context based. You need to change your argument depending on who you're talking to. Okay. So looking at the time, we take the last question. Um, in the Vontosaurus analogy, is there some conflation of the complexity of the real systems challenge with the extent of its representation? In which case, wouldn't great system engineers start to see the gif of the beast from its smiling mouth? Uh, I think if you do MBAC properly, yes, you can, because you're not having this short sightedness of just looking into the smiley face and you'd be able to sort of predict, yes, we can see the complexity is going to go up, but we can manage and control that. And that's one of the reasons why we do MBAC. So like I said, And by applying MBSE properly, we can manage and control that complexity. We know it's coming and we can prepare ourselves for it. The problem that we get is people don't know it's coming. They look into the smiley face and they spend all their time smiling and winking at the brontosaurus without realizing that there's a big belly coming soon. <laughs> okay. Hey, thank you again for the great talk. And thank you for the audience, for your questions and your time. Um, some last words. As mentioned earlier, you can now claim one PDU credit toward your system engineering professional recertification by attending this webinar. You may also claim this credit res uh, retrospectively for encoded webinars that you have attended and where attendance meets the qualification requirements. I would like to express thanks again to Lockheed Martin Corporation for sponsoring the 2021 ENCODI webinar program. So my last words, thank you very much, John. It was a pleasure and see you soon. Goodbye. See you at the next one. Everybody have a good Christmas. Stay safe. Bye-bye.